While we have already looked at the syntax of normal logic programming rules in section 1, where we more or less looked at the mathematical core of ASP's language, we now want to look at what the modeling language of real ASP systems have to offer uh, beyond that. So after having looked at the, the semantic stable model definition, we thus come back to the syntax now, look again at logic programs, but now from a more practical point of view. How can we actually model actual problems? How can we go from here to there in the real world? Actually, the first two components, facts and rules, correspond to what I've been calling the mathematical core of ASP. These are just rules that are composed of atoms. Here, P of X, Q of X, R of X. The only difference here is the X. So here in the, in the, in the modeling language, we also have variables that stand for objects. And such a, such a rule here then abbreviates or is an abbreviation or a schema that stands for all ground rules that are obtained by systematically replacing all the variables. The way grounding works is actually looked at in more detail in the next section, so let's just um, uh, not detail this here. So the idea is more or less you start with a program consisting of facts and facts have no variables, again something we will detail later on. And such rules here are placeholders for rules without variables. So in this case, we only have one constant, 42. We replace it here with all the x and we get a propositional variable. And in general, if there are more variables, more objects, you can imagine that a single rule with variables stands for several variable free rules, which are propositional because they have no variables anymore. So anyway, this is more or less the, um, the basic constituents of, of logic programs. I've already uh, shown you briefly in the first section that this, the syntax, so more or less this is the if operator or the implication, right, colon minus. Then we also use a, a, a comma for conjunction and a not or n, not uh, for negation. And finally, in, 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 in a, for real systems, every rule has to be terminated by a dot just to, to tell the parser this is the end of the rule. But now let's look at more interesting language constructs that go beyond this. Now the first language construct I want to talk about is called conditional literal. So conditional literals are literals just that they have a condition attached to them. So here is one in the body and this is more or less marked by the yellow, somehow yellow font, right? And it can be read as Q of X if R of X. Now, it's a conditional and logically actually, sorry for the non-logicians, you can also interpret this as an implication, just as this guy, and, but this is the principal implication of the rule and this would somehow be a nested implication. But again, those are interested of this, read up or wait for the logical section on, on things. Okay, otherwise, I think the more pragmatic uh, approach to understand what a conditional literal is, is to think of sets. Now just imagine for the time being that here we would have a par an opening parenthesis and here we would have a closing parenthesis, then I think we all would read this as a set. So collect all the instances of Q of X for which R of X holds, right? Instances means replacements of X by objects. Okay, and then more or less in the end, this set would replace a set of instances of Q of X for which you have checked that R of X holds. So just as an example, imagine that R of 1 and R of 2 are true. This is the only, these are the only ones for R. Then our imaginary set would contain Q of 1 and Q of 2. Okay? Okay, now again, it was an imaginary set. Now forget the set again and just think, oh, what are we doing here? We have a literal in the body. And in the body, actually, we deal with a conjunction of literals. We have this, co this comma here, right? And this is also what's happening here. So we collect all the instances of Q of X that satisfy this condition, and then we expand this as a conjunction. So again, if R of 1 and R of 2 would be true, then this here would expand to the body which contains two atoms, Q of 1 and Q of 2. Well, you may ask yourself, what is this good for? Well, first of all, it's, 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 it's cool to talk about all the instances all the instances of the conjunction of all the instances of Q of X for which a condition is satisfied without knowing which ones this will be. So you more or less, it's a bit like a quantification, right? You quantify over objects that have a certain property. 
And in modeling, this comes in really handy, but I'm afraid now all I can do is a bit hand waving and introduce this, but you will see actually the utility of this later on. Now, in Harry Potter terminology, rule an integrity construction is literally a headless rule. Uh, rule so heads like this can be here, extended where to have no junctions of literals. Now, and in hence we have what does it mean to be headless, which is the same. So headless means represents a that disjunction. it's a rule that can derive. So you would read this here as actually instead. Um, and now, P of what does X it mean logically? Q of it means X that if, if these conditions in the body are true, you derive. So we will a not be dealing a lot with this well, junction. Hence, I want to be very straight right? on that. Anyway, but so one thing perhaps to note is that constraint this junction in the ESP that must is not be satisfied exclusively any solution. nor inclusively. Let's just check this. this is actually subject so to minimization. What we have to look at is we have so to make sure that there is the no X, model, only the no substitution for X of, or that satisfies the minimal both number of Q. Uh, atoms are true that need to so be. It must not be the case. And q of x as a side remark of x is true disjunction for some x. It's actually a language construction. If this is the case, that again, the language we would truly logically more derive a contradiction. So, and but you also raise this is one interpretation. Of it. From I think those of you familiar with the polynomial right, interpretation. Anyway, uh, now database systems, systems no interest. We won't talk a lot about this. They are guaranteeing the consistency of the database that I will add. So it's later but on. it's not something okay. that can query or that contributes now the to the answer language concept is, is very useful. useful. One. That's the same here. It's called again in ASP. You derive atoms by rules, and only atoms that are in the head of rules can contribute to a stable model. So integrity constraints are headless to talk about Harry Potter again, and they cannot contribute, they only check the condition. So if this condition here is satisfied, a contradiction is generated, and the current stable model candidate is eliminated. And again, this is very useful, not only in databases, but also in ASP for modeling, where you more or less generate solution candidates and check them afterwards. Okay, so, so far concerning integrity constraint. Let's see what comes next. Oh, you're still there. Great, because now we talk about choice rules. Now, given that we have just seen headless rules with integrity constraints, now we see rules with rather rich heads, where it's not determined what you derive, but only the constraints on, the, on what you derive are given. So here, this is a choice rule. So this is the choice construct in the head. And it says that among the atoms or literals in the set, that are generated after grounding, you have to pick at least two and at most seven. So this is of course a non-deterministic construct where a, a set is generated and then you only say how many elements must be picked at least and at most. It's a bit like in Lotto, right? Where you have a bucket with, uh, with, with, with little balls and numbers on them and then someone draws, draws them, and the only thing you say, you have to draw at least, I don't know, two balls and at most seven balls. But how many you draw and which ones you draw is completely left to the system. You only describe this here. This again is something that is very useful. Again, as I mentioned, it's a non-deterministic concept and a, a, a very nice application is for its configuration. Imagine that you want to configure a computer and you say, oh, you want at least two hard disks with certain conditions and at most, well, seven hard disks may be a bit, may be a bit overkill or you may even want to talk about the price and so on and want to constrain that, right? So if you want to talk about the price, actually choice rules are not exactly what you want. There you want to use aggregates, which we discuss next. Stay tuned. Aggregates can actually be thought of as generalizations of such choices where here I give a sum aggregate where the idea is that you don't just count here the number of occurrences of an atom. No, you actually have a value here, which is a term and this has to be an integer, where you then take the sum of all the integers for which this condition here is true. So I just use two and seven again, and this simply means that the sum of all x, such that this condition here satisfied, p of x, y, and q of x, is between two and seven. And the most popular aggregates are count aggregates and sum aggregates. And in fact, this guy here is a hidden count aggregate. But we talk about this in terms of choices because after all, it's to make choices. Well, here I use this now in the body of a rule and it's something that you check. But things can be get more complex. Anyway, 
So this is more or less the basic or core language of ASP systems like Klingo or DLD. And uh, now we have two or actually just one command left, which actually is not part of the language, even though the, you write it in the source file, but it talks to the solver and gives it instructions what models to generate. Okay, so we'll do this in a sec. Last but not least, let me talk about two alternative ways to instruct the ASP solver to compute minimal stable models. And minimality is here determined by objective functions. That is functions that you apply to the stable model and then you get a value and the solver more or less searches for the, for the models that have the minimum value with respect to this function. So there are two alternative ways to express this. Let me first talk about this one here. This is to use weak constraints. And weak constraints are nice because they look more or less like, well, weakened integrity constraints. Just compare this with, with an integrity constraint. Again, an integrity constraint is a condition, is a hard condition that must not be violated. Well, here the weak constraint, it's also a condition. And, but you actually may, you shouldn't violate it, but you may violate it. If you violate, you pay a price. And this is the, here in this case, this is the, the integer instantiated here for this, for the variable C. So if this, if, if you have an X that satisfies Q and you have X and C that satisfies P, then if this is the case, then more or less the penalty that this stable model pays is C and this way you add up all the all the conditions that are violated and then each stable model has a has a value and so and then actually with by by posing such constraints here you then instruct the solver to compare the stable models and find the minimum one what is nice is in ASP you have the possibility not only to have a single objective function but you can have several ones. So this is here indicated by multi-objective optimization. So for instance, if you want to, play, want to plan a trip, you may want to have a trip with minimum, minimum, minimum length of minimum length of kilometers, minimum length of driving, for instance, autobahns uh, or highways are faster than tiny roads. So that may not be the same. And perhaps even minimum uh, gas consumption or petrol consumption, right? These are already, are already three objectives and you can actually optimize all three of them. And well, first of all, they are distinguished here by the level. So this level 42, so all the constraints at the, at the same level are added. And so, and then you have to rank them. So this actually is, uh, is a lexicographic uh, ranking that you then compute. You, you have to say that more or less, well, I don't know, the duration of the trip is the most important. So we give it a very high number like 4711. And then the, I don't know, the number of kilometers is, is perhaps second, you give it a lower number. Um, 42, right? And so on and so forth, right? And then what happens is you do lexicographic, you compare stable models if you have them lexicographically. You first compare the objective function, the value of the objective function of each model with the highest value. If they are the same, then you look at the second value. And one, if one is better, you choose the one that has the lower, the lower value there. It's a bit like in the telephone book, right, where you compare names. You first compare the first letter of a name, then the second one, and then more or less you, you in this way you order them. Okay, good. So this is more or less how weak constraints work. And in the same way, there are minimized statements. And these are more or less more explicit directives to the solver as, as indicated in Klingo by the hash symbol here that precedes it. But this says the same thing just in a, in, a, in, a, in a more central way than the weak constraints. So more or less it, it, it regroups all, it, this regroups more or less all, uh, all it, uh, weak constraints of this form here, but you explicitly say mini, you want to minimize the sum of all the costs such that this condition is satisfied and this is associated with the, with, with the objective function at level 42. And again, you can translate these minimized statements in weak constraints and vice versa. And I think you get a bit the idea. It's about bit the, the way you want to model it. Well, whether you rather want to have uh, several conditions that you distribute, or if you want to have central conditions where you say, I minimize the sum uh, of, of the values here, right? And of course, here, the keyword sum is omitted. Actually, it's not even existing. Minimize implicitly minimizes the sum. And there is also a maximize. Actually, there's a maximize statement here, but to in to encode here maximize, you have to use, for instance, negative numbers. Okay, anyway, 
I don't want to, 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 to lose too much uh, words on, on optimization. This is very important in practice because in practice you always want to have not only uh, solutions that are feasible but also optimum solutions. So among the feasible solutions you want to have, have the best ones. But to be honest now when we start modeling we mainly concentrate on the above features that actually constitute a logic program. Okay, so again, to make you fit for the modeling part that will come soon, we first have to see a little bit how these variables are handled and how one actually gets from a program with variables to a program without. So how does grounding work? 